So if we go back to the handout, we did the first section of handout number four. On handout number four, we have a second part right here where, we, where we're going to edit a couple of things from the config XML file. Remember, this file defines a lot of the basic attributes of your app. So here I will, for the moment, minimize my command prompt. You could do this from the command prompt, I suppose, but it's just a lot easier through Windows. So I'm going to go over to my flash drive where I've got my project. If I open computer and then I go to my flash drive, there's that apps folder that I created through the command prompt. I will open the apps folder. There's the template folder, the template project I just created. At the moment, just for my own uh, knowledge, it's um, 24 megabytes. Uh, 85 megabytes, I suppose, because of the inefficient Windows 7 file system. But um, it's a self-contained project here with the Android template and the browser template. As I add more, then it gets bigger and bigger. The cool thing is, though, eventually when we actually do compile it as a real app, it goes down to like 1 megabyte, 2 megabytes. So you're not building an 80 megabyte app unless you do have a lot of pictures and video and multimedia, like a game. But for the app that we're going to create, or most apps, data-driven and such, they're going to be two megabytes, one megabyte. This is just all of the resources it needs while we're in development. And so inside the template folder, we need to go back into the config XML file to set a few basic items of our template. Right-click config XML. Right-click it so that you can then select edit with notepad++. plus plus. Yes. When you try to create, when you try to create that in my uh, command prompt, I, I try to change the app, and it just, it's not changing the app. Your particular flash drive All right, so in this config XML file, we have to set a few basic things, thinking in terms that this is a template that we will use for future projects. So not everyone's will be exactly the same, but let's look at this. On line 2, we've got a spot there to change a version number. This version number actually is totally optional that you, that you do anything intelligent here, because the user will see this, 
but the App Store doesn't care about this. I'll explain that in a moment. What I'm saying here on line two, that if I misspelled my package ID when I first did Taco Create, that's where I fix it. If I misspelled the name of my app, well, that's where I fix it, line three. We all start off with a 0 0.01. We have a major version, a minor version, and a mini version or something. This can be any schema that we want. We can do this is version 1.0 of our project. Whatever. We can use any schema that we want. Usually this top level is a big version of our app. We're working on version 1 of our app. We're going to release it in the App Store next month. It's version 1. Then eventually we're going to keep working on it to add more features like a brand new Bluetooth connectivity feature. Well, that might be a version 2 level. Maybe what we do actually is add more features but not so revolutionary. So it's a, it's a 1.2. And then, whoops, I made a spelling mistake. I had to quickly release another version. Okay, it's a 1.2.5. So whatever we want to do here is fine. The user will see this. The App Store won't care what you write here, really. I'm recommending to write something more like this, 1.1.2016.10.06, which is just today's date. It's the release of today. Could, well, we're going to change it tomorrow, yes, and we're going to change it the next week, yes, doesn't matter. The big idea is that this is version 1 of our project. Maybe if we're going to be really, really technical about it, well, we're still working on the beta version. So maybe I want to call it 0 0.1. You want to call this whatever you want, and that is saying something like that. Eventually we'll talk about releasing it, and we are going to release a version 2.0 with more features. So eventually when we get to that point, I might call this 2.1-2016-11-15 when we get to that point next month. The rest of the line is fine, doesn't matter. Line three, you know what that is already. Um, oh, uh, after version here, this is the one that the App Store does care about. We have to have a new attribute here. Android dash version code, notice the capital C, one. This is going to be whole numbers only, incrementing every time we upload to the App Store. Eventually, we'll, we're going to upload this to the Android App Store, iPhone App Store, and this is version 1. This is the first version of the code of our project. If we release even a minor little patch to the App Store, we have to then increment it to Android Code 2. If we release a brand new 2.0 version, well, we're going to need to release it as Android version code 3. So we will always increment this by a whole number when we're going to upload it to the App Store. And this number here does not need to match what the version is up here. It probably won't very quickly. So let's type this. After the existing code, Android, after version, Android dash version code, capital C, equals, quote, 1. This is the very first version of our apps code that we will be uploading eventually. Android version code 1. Line 3 is fine. Line 4, I'm going to delete all of that, except for the tags, of course. Um, say my template project for future taco projects. Anything you want, really. Number five, that's another spot, anything you want. Your email as a developer, your website if you have one, and your name as a development company. So as an example, this will be um, dev at johnjones.biz and the website is johnjones.biz you for yourself 
can of course decide to put whatever you want here. You're a real developer now. Congratulations. This will be jjapps.llc, whatever. You're a developer. You want to be the full official one with a business license on all of that? Sure. You can go to City Hall, get a business license, you're totally real. Here, you can still make an app, you can still sell apps, you can still get rich off of it without having to do anything extra special. Later on, we do have to set up a developer certificate. We'll get to that later. The thing about doing this um, for our template is this will then be fully set up when we do subsequent apps. I'm the developer, I'm going to make more apps, I'm going to keep it consistent. Description, href, okay, good, company, sounds good, save. Okay, so we're going to add a couple of um, preferences here. I'm going to lock my orientation to portrait. At the moment, our taco, our Cordova project, is, has no orientation lock. If you go horizontal, the app will shift horizontal. Maybe you want that, maybe you don't. The particular app that I want to create, I want it to be locked. Because a person can lock their orientation on their device. Yes, but if they don't have it locked and they go horizontal, they're going to get a weird design, perhaps. I want it to be locked vertically. So we'll need to add a permission, uh, or preference. Preference name equals orientation value portrait. So this is going to be before we get to the Android specific ones. Platform Android right here. It's going to be a single tag. These XML tags do not have a pair, this particular one. It's um, preference. Make sure you spell that properly, of course. Preference, space, name. They all have the syntax of name equals something, and then value equals something. This particular preference is dealing with orientation, capital O. So we'll write orientation, capital O, and value portrait. We can go look up in the official documentation over at uh, cordova.apache.org what are the possibilities here. Portrait, keep it always portrait. Landscape, keep it always landscape. Putting nothing here is automatic, whatever the person chooses. But I want it to stay portrait. Next line, we're going to need another one of these. So the same syntax, preference, name equals something, value equals something. I'm going to do it twice, so I'll copy and paste that. Oh, and we need a space here. This XML standard needs to be this way. When you were dealing with HTML5 and we had a single self-closing tag, I said, we'll just write it like that. That's, X, that's HTML5. We're not dealing with HTML5, we're dealing with XML. Here we have to have it with a space and a closing slash. It's a single tag, but it closes itself this way. Preference. When you copy and paste, make sure you're copying and pasting correctly. Preference. So we need a preference to first of all then say here disallow over scroll true. <laughs> when you're on a website on your browser and you scroll up and down, eventually you get to the end of the website and you get a little bit of visual feedback. You're at the end of the website, usually a little bounce animation or a glow animation, something that shows you you're at the end. Uh, I don't want that for my app because that's something I often see for websites. Apps, I don't see that really. I just scroll to the end and, and I'm at the end. So I want to say disallow over scroll. True, I don't want that extra little bit of animation that makes it look like you're at the end of a website. Disallow over scroll capital. This, 
allow underscore true. Right, true. Deactivate that little bit of extra animation that breaks the illusion that it's a real app. We can have a default color behind everything. When we go from screen to screen, there will be like a blank invisible part of the app, perhaps. So if we put in a default basic color, um, that will keep our app design consistent. And that means we have background color, capital B, capital C. This value has to be in XML format. When I say all of this about it, it has to be this and that. How do I know that? I read the documentation at cordova.apache.org. All of this is coming from that. It has to be in hexadecimal format, starting off with 0x. That's a 0, not an O. 0x. Usually hexadecimal is six values, so if we have something like 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, there would be some color, red, green, blue. These first two right here are red, then green, then blue. In hexadecimal numbers, we can have, you know, AA22 FF. That's another color. I don't know what it is. I don't think in hexadecimal. But this one also has a, a, a an eighth or a fourth pair. That's transparency. FF, fully visible color. Zero, zero, fully invisible color. Somewhere in the middle, halfway visible color. We want the fully visible color. And I just chose some color there, A, B, C, D, E, F. That is a, hexa a valid hexadecimal color. I think it's like a blue. But before that, FF, full visibility, full opacity of the color before my actual color. Black is F, fully black is F, 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 all the colors. No, wait a minute. Backwards. Sorry, backwards. Zero, 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 zero. Um, in this case, yes, black and white is pretty easy. So zero, zeros are black. That's no color. F, 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 F is, is all color, which is white. Uh, okay, so then we have okay background color. Okay, then we're gonna have some Android specific code. We're gonna add again preference name value, and then we're gonna say specifically for Android in the Android section, any one of the ones listed down there. Minimum SDK version, target SDK version. Um, we saw in the SDK Manager screen we had a listing of Android 2.2, Android 3.0, Android 4. Point whatever, Android 5. Point whatever, and the one that just came out a couple of weeks ago, Android 7. There's all of those versions of Android. I also said that another way to delineate them is the APK version. APK 3, APK 4, 5, 8, 12, 25, whatever it is on right now. And then the code name based on suites. Here we're saying, what's the minimum version of Android that we're targeting? I think that's like Android 4.0 and up. So that means people with an Android 3 device or an Android 2 device won't be able to use our app. If we put a lower number, we can target more devices. Higher number, we can target less de devices. And this is always the problem with app developers. Let's say if we're only targeting Android, again, I've got a 5. I've got a 6.0 device right here and a 5.0 device right here. Uh, I'm not going to do the 3.0 branch because that was anyway an anomaly. If I know my history of Android devices, the 3x branch was an anomaly. They were going to fork it off, they said never mind, and they merged it back together. Okay, but what about people with an Android 2.0 device? I have to say I'm sorry to them first, and second, 
you know, we have to evolve. We have to go forward. If we keep trying to target devices that less and less and less and less people are using, our app gets bigger and bigger and bigger because we have to target more devices. So if we wanted to target even older devices, we'd have a smaller number. I'm fine with 4.0 and up. You may not be, so you can change that to whatever you want. I would not change this up to like 20 or 24, then it's only targeting the newest devices, and that might be too restrictive. I can go to developer.android.com and they will show me a chart, an official Google chart, that says what are the ones in use. And we're going to see that the 2x branch at the moment has like a 1% market share, and the 3.0 branch has a very small market share. And the larger market shares are the 4x branch. <coughs> And then a smaller margin is the 5x and the 6x, and then even the 7x. The newest ones are less used. Unfortunately, we are at the mercy of our providers. AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile, they're not playing um, fairly, and they're not often releasing the latest version of Android to your device. I just got the patch update to my device, which hadn't been updated since May. And there's a bunch of bugs between May and now, but AT&T decided to release it, you know, a week ago. If you've got the official Google phone from Google, yes, you have the latest, but not everyone does. So I'm fine with this preference here. Go ahead and type that. I will put it in any one of these platforms of Android. Preference name value need android dash min notice the spelling capital S DK capital version 14 so the minimum version that our that our app will run on is android 14 Oops. And then target <coughs> SDK. We're using the Android 14 version of the code that's currently installed on our computers. We may have a newer version, older version, but we're using that version of the Android code to compile our code. That's all I need to do at this point. with my config file. Any questions on the config file? The last note on my handout then is, okay, I want to see this. So you have here, you will then decide what you want to do. Taco emulate Android. Taco run Android device. I forgot to put dash dash device, but do that for my other handout. Taco run browser or taco emulate browser, same thing. I'm usually not going to do emulate on my device because it's my computer because it's kind of slow, but I often will do taco run browser or taco emulate browser. So I'm in my template taco emulate browser. This is not the same at all as if I had double clicked the index.html file and open it in Chrome. Don't do that. Don't double click your index file to open in the web browser. If you want to see this project in the web browser, you have to do taco emulate browser or taco run browser. Because the browser, specifically Google Chrome, will act like a mobile device. Firefox will not. Safari will not. Internet Explorer will not. You have to have Google Chrome browser if you want to do taco run browser or taco emulate browser. Looks like a plain old website like we've seen before, but it's behaving like an app. Google makes Google Chrome. Google makes Android. So they've made it that if you use the Google Chrome browser, it will behave like a website. I mean like an app. And notice your, your link at the top. It's running off of a server, localhost, port 8000, and running the index file.
whenever I'm in the uh, emulate browser, even if I close the browser, the command prompt still sort of stays stuck there. We need to close the last command here, which is control C. If you press control C twice, actually, that's a little faster than saying yes. If you press control C again, it'll break you out back to the command prompt. And in this time, I will do taco run device, uh, taco run Android, which taco run Android by itself often works. But sometimes I've noticed for people, for whatever reason, your, your computer forgets that your device is plugged in. This one seems to force it always to go to the device, so just to be safe. But personally at home, I simply do Taco Run Android and it does it. For various reasons, it might not do it here, but here it should force it. Question? Okay, so I'm running on my real device, my template project. If you're running it on a real device, and you go over to your home screen, and you go over to your apps window, you will see an app there called Template with the Cordova mascot icon. So you have a real app installed on your real device. Every time we do changes to the template, and then we do Taco Run Android, it'll automatically update it. And that device I mean, that app is installed on the device. If later on we're finished with our template and we create a new version of the app, the template will still be there. You have to uninstall the app. T devices are different, but usually if you tap and hold, it'll give you the trash can to uninstall. So you do have a real app installed like you would from the App Store. So tapping and holding it will let you remove it or check app. Uh, info on your real device. If you drag it over to your app info, in my case, it says right there, version 1.1.2016.10.06. And it's currently taking up 1.82 megabytes on my device. So it went from that 25 megs down to 1.8. And then at the bottom, it says permissions. This app can access the following on your phone read phone status and identity, record audio, approximate location, modify your contacts, modify or delete the contents of your SD card. They make it sound way scarier than it needs to be, but that's what all these permissions that we asked for. Control vibrations, change your audio settings, find accounts on the device. Again, sounds very scary, but that's those are the permissions that Facebook asks you for that Instagram asks you for, that your bank asks you for, to access your device.
Okay, let me give you one more handout. This is another one in our basic workflow. These are things you need to know in a basic level. We then, of course, have to import our app from last month and learn what more we can do with Cordova, but we'll get to that. For the moment, go back to the network folder and you have a brand new one. Campus 5, Taco Workflow 2. Copy Workflow 2. Let's see what we've got in this handout. I'm going to introduce these two concepts now, and then we will see how much more useful they are later. So if you open number five, we have the Android monitor that we want to use, like for debugging and testing. And we've also got the ability to take screenshots of the device. We can do these two things to either an emulated device or a real device. Um, the monitor will help us, again, keep track and debug our, our app. And screenshots, we're going to need screenshots a lot later when we eventually get to the App Store. We need to promote our our app. We need to show screenshots of what it looks like. How does it work? We can take snapshots from our device. So here, we will see how to monitor our app with the Android SDK tools. So I'm going to minimize everything and I'm going to follow that path. Open your computer, computer window, open local disk C, Open program files x86. Open Android. Then Android SDK for Windows. And then Tools. So you're going to go to this far, launch monitor.bat, double click it. So you should see something in the folder called monitor.bat right there, double click it. If you've got a lot of windows open in the background, sometimes what happens is this pops up here. If you've got a lot of windows on your screen, it probably popped up behind everything. And it does not show up on the status bar. So then you're like, where did it, where did it go? And you double click monitor again and nothing happens. And you double click monitor again and nothing happens. So I had kind of minimized things and I see that it's behind everything right there. Nothing will happen until you confirm here. Would you like to send Google statistics of your usage of the Android tools? Yes or no? It's optional. I feel to put no because that uses up resources. It's going to run some sort of background process and send stuff through my network and such. This is optional. But if you don't have the monitor by now, all of this time that I've been talking, if the monitor has not appeared yet, most likely minimize your windows and you've got something waiting for you to click proceed. After you proceed, then you will get Android Device Monitor. This screen is very complex, but this is our debugging screen and our monitoring <laughs> screen. different tabs and windows. So on the left side I've got devices, I've got my Motorola device plugged in. Technically, internally, that's what it's known as. Uh, I can see various aspects of the device, File Explorer and such. And then I, if I'm plugged in, at, if I have a real device plugged in, I'm going to see a constant stream of stuff happening. Even though I'm not touching my device, even though it's in sleep mode, it's doing stuff behind the scenes, such as checking in with the NSA once in a while, I mean, uh, connecting to the network and all of that. It's doing stuff behind the scenes. Over here, checking the battery status and all of that stuff. So it's constantly doing stuff. If you're running an emulator, you should still see an emulated device here. I've got two apps that I've recently run on my device. 
the app that I just created from Taco. There's my package ID and some other project that I had running. So I've got these two apps running, and notice I can do something here like stop the app and such. But the point of this is when we were te when we were writing code last month, when it was a plain old website, we would look at the Google, Chrome, or Firefox console to see some output. Remember, we would write ourselves console output all the time. Well, we're running this as a real app now on a real device. One way to get that console output, we'll still be able to see console output, but we can look at it here. It is going to get mixed in with all of this basic stuff that happens on my device, so I can create a filter on the left side to only focus on feedback that I'm getting from my app in question. On the left you will see a tab for devices, on the bottom you will see a tab of logcat. I've got a device running, uh, an app running on the left, click the triangle to see your apps, okay good. You should see your app's package name, the ID, com.jones.template. In the logcat at the bottom left, in the saved filters section, click the plus symbol. There are no filters, so we see everything and it just zooms by. Click to add a new log cat filter on the bottom left. If your screen is uh, very tight down there, obviously you can resize these screens, these tabs. Um, but I'll add a new log cat filter. We can name the filter whatever we want. I'll just call it my app or template, whatever. We can have multiple filters. And I want to filter by application name, which is not the pretty name of your app, it's the name of your app as your package ID, which in my case is com.jones.template. Obviously, if you did not put taco create jones, this is not what you type. You type what you see on the monitor there, what you named it with your ID. Click OK. And now there's messages happening globally on the device. There's no messages on my current device. I mean my current app. It's a very simple app. It's not really doing anything. But if I were um, putting log console log output and such, it would appear here. That's the whole point of this. So I can see console output. But I need to create a filter, or else I can't. I can't exactly see anything. Which step? So in the log cat in the save filter section, bottom left, click the plus symbol, and then in the filter name, I type a name, and then the package ID. So I don't really see any console output, that's fine, it's a very basic app, but this is how we create the filter. And once we start to do, once we start to write our JavaScript code and such, doing console output, it's, uh, it'll appear here. What we can also do in this uh, in this device monitor is the second part about here when you're ready to publish your app to Google Play or Amazon App Store or Apple App Store you will, you will need a variety of assets to market the app screenshots are used to show previews of the app before download so here in monitor in the device monitor I've got an app that's running and then on the left side, there's my device that's running. And I have a row of icons at the top here. One of them is a little camera to take a screenshot. I click that. 
there's a screenshot of my device. It's not live, so if I go back to my home screen and I look at a different screen, it doesn't change until I refresh. And then I would see the latest version of what's on my device's home screen. So eventually when I'm running my real app and I want to show off the different features of my app, I would go to this screen and save a screenshot. There is a way to save screenshots on from my device directly, yes. But here, I can save them on my computer and access them directly on my computer, like edit them in Photoshop, upload them directly to the App Store. If I take a screenshot on my device itself, I have to get it to myself somehow. All you have to do then, if you want, you can then click Save, and this will save it as a high-quality PNG graphic. You don't have to do this right now. We will get to this later. And so I have this screenshot of what my device was showing at that moment. And it doesn't have to be just my app. Anything that I'm showing on my screen of my device can be saved. It doesn't record video. That's a completely different thing. But this is useful for creating screenshots of what's on my device. So that's what this handout is all about. It's in the network folder now. And um, this is just informational for the moment. We don't need to look at the log cat just yet. We don't need to make screenshots just yet, but I want to give this to you now, later on, when we actually write real code for our app and such, and we have to make screenshots, this will, I'll get back to this, but I, I'm giving you this handout right now, and um, it's informational. I'll turn the printer back on later if you want to print it. Any questions on uh, handout number five here? So, I'm going to close the Android device monitor for the moment.